Hey everybody, it's Lance and welcome back to another episode of Pastor's Bible Study. We're over 20 episodes into the Gospel of Mark so far. Whether you've done all of them or this is your very first one, I'm glad that you're with me. We're in Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, beginning with verse 46. Jesus and his followers came into Jericho. As Jesus was leaving Jericho, together with his disciples and a sizable crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, Timaeus' son, was sitting beside the road. When he heard that Jesus of Nazareth was there, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, show me mercy. Many scolded him, telling him to be quiet, but he shouted even louder, son of David, show me mercy. Jesus stopped and said, call him forward. They called the blind man, be encouraged, get up, he's calling you. Throwing his coat to the side, he jumped up and came to Jesus. Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said, teacher, I want to see. Jesus said, Go, your faith has healed you. At once he was able to see, and he began to follow Jesus on the way. Okay, so one thing to point out, remember that when we have miraculous accounts in the Gospels, when Jesus does something like that, it's not only communicating what he's capable of doing literally and physically for the people there in the moment, but also about what he is capable of doing for us in this moment and this has something to do with the idea of being able to see clearly and being able to follow jesus that's what happens in the life of bartimaeus he's not able to see and to follow and then he asked to be able to and he's now able to see and to follow clearly in the way of jesus and so there's a lot of different aspects of this miraculous account and one of the clearest ones is one of the things that jesus provides for you is the ability to see and follow him so think about that So often we think of the concept of being a Christian or spiritual growth. It's just a constant list of things to do or to not do. And depending whether or not you're able to do them is dependent on your own will or self-control or energy. One of the key aspects of our Methodist understanding is that it's the grace, a power, a work, a presence of Christ that enables you to follow him. And our posture is asking for it and being open to it and receiving it. And that's what we see so clearly in this story. One of the things I wanna highlight is that Bartimaeus is calling out to Jesus with the name Son of David. And in doing so, he's indicating the expectation that a Messiah, an anointed one, is going to come from the family tree of David, the great king from a thousand years before. He's also identifying that traditionally in their, in their culture, son of David was a term used for Solomon, David's actual biological son, who is considered to have wisdom and even some ability to work magic seemingly and to heal. And so he's identifying Jesus as being someone who has the capacity to heal him. He's identifying all those things and people are hushing him, right? He doesn't want to hear from you. You're someone of low status. You're someone that we need to distance ourselves from. And well, Jesus indicates that his values are very different, right? He wants people like this to come to him. He highlights that it's this man's faith in him that has made this work possible. And then one of the key questions that I want to lift up to you today is he asked this man, what do you want me to do for you? Right? It'd be one thing for Jesus to just assume that, of course, we're on exactly the same page here. But Jesus says explicitly, what is it that you really want? What do you need? What do you need from me? What do you need from me that only I can provide? Some of you are watching individually. Some of you are listening on podcasts. Some of you are watching together as a small group. And so, particularly if you're with a group, I invite you to pause. Even if you're by yourself, I invite you to pause and reflect on this question. If you had Jesus in front of you today... How would you answer that question? What do you want me to do for you? Right? It indicates a lot about the desires that are on our hearts. And it indicates a lot about what you need. It indicates about what you're hurting and what you hope for. If Jesus was right in front of you, how would you answer that question? What do you want me to do for you? What does that say about where you're at right now? And here's a, here's a reminder. Jesus is actually in front of you. So what's your answer? Okay. I'm going to get into our next portion of scripture reading here. Mark's Gospel, chapter 11. This is an incredibly important piece of scripture to understand uh, the the symbolism and the meaning. And it's a a precursor to the beginning of the end of Jesus' earthly life and ministry. So, okay, chapter 11. When Jesus and his followers approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. Jesus gave two disciples a task, saying to them, Go into the village over there. As soon as you enter it, you will find tied up there a colt that no one has ridden. 
untie it and bring it here. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, its master needs it and he will send it back right away. Okay, so really key to understanding this story is understanding where it's taking place. They're arriving in Jerusalem. And remember, Jerusalem is the political and the military and the cultural and the religious capital of their world. It's the center of everything for the people of Israel. And so in coming to Jerusalem, Jesus is getting closer and closer to the urban center of power and influence. He's been out in the boonies, more or less, right? He's been out in rural areas with smaller crowds, teaching in fields and villages, but now he's in the center of their world. And there's a lot of things that he's going to encounter there. And going to Jerusalem is very intentional, right? He's coming to help the story reach its climax, and he knows what's going to take place. Remember, he keeps saying over and over again what's going to happen when he goes there, guiding his disciples towards anticipating the crucifixion and then the resurrection. This is, Jerusalem has to be the place where it takes place because it's going to be the place where he encounters cultural opposition, where he encounters military opposition by the ruling Romans, and where he encounters opposition from the rulers of the religious authorities centered around temple worship. So one of the key things to understand is that the city of Jerusalem is surrounded by some small suburbs. That's what Bethpage and Bethany are. They would be you know, just a very short walk away. The Mount of Olives is really more the other side of a deep ravine on the east side of the city of Jerusalem. So don't think of a mountain. Think of the city of Jerusalem being surrounded by a deep ravine on three sides. And on the east side, you can walk down and back up again the opposite side. That opposite slope is called the Mount of Olives. One of the things that Jesus is doing in asking to ride in on a colt is a fulfillment of a portion of the Hebrew Bible. Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 is a Hebrew prophecy that talks about the coming of a humble king. And Jesus, in doing what he's doing, is trying to indicate to people how he is the fulfillment of that prophecy and a very different kind of king than they might be expecting. And that's the perfect lead-in into our scripture reading today. So then, as we continue reading, they went and found a colt tied to a gate outside on the street, and they untied it. Some people standing around said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them just what Jesus said, and they left him alone. They brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes upon it, and he sat on it. Many people spread out their clothes on the road, while others spread branches cut from the fields. Those in front of him and those following were shouting, Hosanna! Blessing on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. After he looked around at everything, because it was already late in the evening, he returned to Bethany with the twelve. Okay, sounds like a pretty basic story, right? When we hear it, Jesus is walking into this capital. He says, go and get a colt for me so that I can ride it when I walk in. He does, and he has this huge crowd supporting and cheering him when he does. We celebrate this on a day called Palm Sunday. It's the Sunday before Easter Sunday. It's the beginning of Holy Week, the holiest and most sacred time in the life of the Christian community. And it's important to catch the symbolism of what's happened here. So let me give you a little bit of cultural teaching. In their world, there's something called a triumph, particularly in the Roman kingdom or the Roman Empire. They don't really have an army in the way that we think of an army or centralized control. Understand that their entire society, particularly for the elites, is built on the idea of accumulating honor. Even more than accumulating wealth, life as a super elite is about accumulating honor. And one of the ways that you can do that is to raise an army, to go off and conquer people, and to come back with a bunch of riches and slaves and spoils of your victory. And when you do, you throw yourself something called a triumph. And a triumph is a parade. It's you coming into town with a huge procession of all the indicators of your wealth in front of you. I'm thinking of Aladdin right now. Remember when Aladdin goes into the kingdom? So you would have in front of you all the slaves that you've conquered and all the money that you've brought in. And at the very end would be you, right? And it would all be leading up to you. And you would probably be riding on the most majestic and regal and fiercest looking horse that you could possibly have. And beside you would be the kings that you've conquered, bound up as slaves, etc., 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 right? That's what a triumph is all about. And ultimately, it's about accumulating honor for yourself and showing off your military power and prowess and how it is that everybody else better fall in line behind you because what of a big, scary guy you are. So Jesus knows that. He knows that that's how kings and rulers and the super elites come into town. So what does he do? 
He comes in from the other side of town. He comes in on the back of a borrowed donkey and with nothing but himself and his humble itinerant followers, right? He's sending a message that he's a very different kind of king than what they're expecting. Now, the people in the community greet him with these incredible acclaims, right? Hosanna, which means save us now in their language. Save us now. Blessing on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessing on the coming kingdom of our ancestor in the dais. Hosanna in the highest. Save us now in the highest. And they're throwing palm fronds and their clothes on the ground in front of him, right? Why are they doing that? They're doing that because they have an expectations of a coming king, of a coming Messiah, one of us, one of the people of Israel, who's going to throw off the yoke of our Roman oppressors, going to kick out the bad guys, the army that's defeated us and occupied us and extorts taxes and wealth from our community and stops us from following the religious obligations that we hold most dear to our community. He's going to be the one who saves us from that. And so they're greeting him like a conquering military king because that's what they want him to be. Does that make sense? That's key to understanding how we get from this moment to the crucifixion. Because the very same people who are cheering Jesus and celebrating him and are so thankful that he's come into Jerusalem and are throwing their coats on the ground and saying, save us now, the same people that are crying with joy at seeing him are going to be the very same people that are cheering for and calling for his death by Friday. How? It's because ultimately he wasn't what they expected. And so to first understand why that's the case, you have to understand what they expected. They expected a conquering king who would kick out the bad guys, and instead he comes like this, and he's trying to tell them. He's trying to show them. He's trying to display how different he is, and they just won't see it. That's our point of reflection today, right? What's the difference between who we want Jesus to be and who he's telling us he actually is? Think hard about that. Think hard about how you as an individual, maybe the people that you know, maybe culturally, how we want Jesus to be something for us, right? We want him to be this thing because this is what we want. And he's trying with his humility and his grace and his patience to say, yeah, but this is what I am because this is what you actually need. You want that conquering king. You want that person who's just going to kick out the Romans and save your community. But what you need is God with you, incarnate and present for the salvation of your soul. What do we want him to be? And what is he telling us he actually is? And what does that tell us about what we actually need? God bless you, friends. I'm so thankful that you participated in another episode of the Pastor's Bible Study. And we'll go on to the next one soon.